Dr. Ellen Schur is an associate professor at the University of Washington in the uh, internal, general internal medicine clinics, and uh, she is co-director of the UW Medicine Weight Loss Management Center. Uh, she is the associate core director for energy balance and glucose metabolism and UW Nutrition and Obesity Research Center. Dr. Schur's clinical interests are in weight management and uh, primary care and clinical research interests are focused on obesity, eating behavior, and brain regulation of appetite. Um, this is Ellen, I think, is that Vashon? Possibly, some wonderful beach. And uh, also looks like a great slide with potentially one of her kids did this. She teaches and mentors medical students, physician fellows, and graduate students interested in clinical research and obesity. She's received uh, multiple teaching awards, including the Clinician Scientist Year of the Award of the Year in the Northwest Region, the Society of Gen General Internal Medicine. Her research is uh, published in some of our top journals, uh, and she earned her medical degree at Stanford University, completed her internal medicine internship and residency at the University of Washington. She received her master's degree in epidemiology here at the University of Washington, and it's our greatest pleasure to have her speak with us tonight. I just want to say what a pleasure it is uh, to be here speaking with all of you mini-med students tonight. Um, the title of my talk is Advancements in the Understanding of Obesity. And if you think back uh, to what our old understanding of obesity is, I hope you'll be impressed by the developments that have been made over the last 10 to 15 years in understanding body weight regulation and obesity. So I'll get started with that brief intro. What we'll talk about today is our new understanding of the disease model of obesity. I'll tell you why both genes and the environment matter and we'll talk about the fact that body weight itself is regulated and a little bit about how that happens. One thing I want you all to understand is that the body actually resists weight loss regardless of a person's obesity status. But we can treat obesity successfully and we can particularly impact the health risks such as the diabetes that Earl just gave us such an interesting talk about. At this point, we cannot cure obesity. So by the end of our talk, hopefully you'll be well-versed in uh, these facts. But first, a few basic definitions. Obesity itself is defined by something called the body mass index. And body mass index is an indirect measure of your total body fat stores. It combines your height with your weight squared. Um, and together, if uh, those two things uh, ha uh, come up with a number of 30 or more, that defines obesity, and it's really that simple. We'll find out more about what the disease state actually means in terms of its physiology during my talk. So here's a question. Sit back, relax, and answer the following. Is obesity a disease, yes or no? Well, it's a little bit cheating because I just said that in the very beginning, um, but so you all did very well on your first test. Um, but yes, I believe obesity is a disease. In our old opinion about what it meant when people gained weight, we thought, you know, people gained weight, but they don't have a disease. This is a risk factor for other diseases. In our new understanding, we recognize that not only is uh, obesity an elevated weight, it's actually an impairment in the normal functioning of the body weight regula regulatory system. Many people felt obesity, that's a personal failing. It's a lack of willpower. Now we understand there are actually changes that occur in the way the brain is structured and the way the brain is functioning uh, in its ability to regulate appetite. In the old way of thinking, this is something that anybody can change if they just try hard enough. Now we understand that both inherited and environmental factors influence a person's individual risk of being overweight, and also that once weight is gained, our physiology actually resists weight loss, no matter how hard some people are trying. 
This uh, new understanding has led many medical organizations to endorse the fact that obesity is a disease. This includes the American Medical Association, the World Health, Health Association, the National Institutes of Health, the Food and Drug Administration, those are our US organizations, uh, and many other professional medical societies. So I um, would like to talk to you about the disease model of obesity, and I have a metaphor that I think is very helpful for understanding it, and that metaphor is balloons. But in order to best demonstrate this metaphor, I require a lovely assistant. So I would like it if Dr. Hirsch would please come join us up here <laughs> again. So Dr. Hirsch will be our, our demonstrator, but you can all sit back in the audience and you can think about the last time you blew up a balloon, which he will do for us here today. 20 years ago. 20 years ago? I think so, it's been a while. Okay, all right, well give it a try. So you'll notice, as you're thinking, that when he first started blowing, it was a little bit hard. There was some resistance that he had to overcome. And now, as we've gotten a little bigger, don't pass out. I'll, I'll try that too. Okay. Can it get a little bigger? You want it bigger? Yeah. There we go. We're doing pretty well there. That's good. That's good. So everyone remembers uh, about a balloon, that point at which there's some resistance in the system. And then once you pass that point, it gets easier and easier to blow it up. Is that correct? Yeah, it was. That was correct. If you could just hang on to your balloon for a minute, that okay. would be good. Okay. We'll be using it again later. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you, know, you could return to your Can seat you if you okay, want. Yeah. Yeah. Simon says. Uh, so that resistance in the system is our body weight regulatory system. We have a natural ability to maintain our body weight within a set range, and our body actually resists weight gain to some degree. Once weight is gained past a certain point, however, that system breaks down, and it can become easier and easier to gain additional weight. I'm actually going to require another assistant, so I'm gonna have Dr. Kanderwal come up too. <laughs> Dr. Kanderwal, could you blow up this balloon for me? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Give it a try. Okay, he's, oh, he is very good. That was very good. Very nice. You don't have to keep your balloon blown up. But you notice, did you have to blow pretty hard to blow that up? That was impressive, actually, because I could not actually blow one of those up at home. <laughs> um, you, you may have a seat also. Thanks. <laughs> So we all know that different balloons have a different amount of that resistance. For some balloons, it's gonna take a lot of air to get them to blow up, and others, it's not gonna be so much. And that's our genes. So our genetics determine our risk of obesity. And what is the air going in? That's our environment. Right now, we know we all have a lot of hot air blowing into all of our balloons, because <laughs> that has changed. Now, Dr. Hirsch, do you still have your balloon blown up? I just let the air out. Okay, let the air out of your balloon for me. Okay, that's all gone. all gone. Can you blow it up again for me? Does it seem the same as uh, the first time I handed it to you? Mm -hmm. Okay, blow it up. <laughs> now, was that easier or harder to blow up the second time? I think it was a little easier. A little I'm not easier. as dizzy. You're not as dizzy? No. Good. And so, think, thank you very much. You can keep that for a momentum. Um, so, yes, thank our lovely assistant. So, think about Dr. that balloon that Dr. Hirsch just blew up, or the time you remember when a balloon loses its air, how it, it seems a little wrinkly uh, then after you take it out. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, recover that full integrity, and the same thing is true about the body weight regulatory system. When people lose weight, they do not regain a functional body weight regulatory system. And in fact, the balloon is now a little bit floppy. Well, it's much easier to regain weight even than it was to gain weight initially. So let's talk about those things in detail. How about the genes, the different sizes of all of our balloons? Well, there is no one obesity gene. Uh, there are occasional disorders where a single change in the genes results in severe obesity that un usually manifests in childhood, but those are quite rare. In reality, the majority of our risk is from multiple genes that are inherited together. That's something called polygenic inheritance. And a good way to study it is through twin studies. And twin studies have actually demonstrated that up to 90% 
of the variability in the BMI of all the people in this room is driven by inherited factors given to us from our parents and our ancestors. Um, so when you look at monozygotic twins who share 100% of their body weight, they're not only very similar in physical appearance, but their BMIs are uh, very close. In the University of Washington Twin Registry, over 90% of our monozygotic twins have BMIs that are within three kilograms of each other, or six pounds. Instead, when you look at dizygotic or fraternal twins who share on average 50% of their uh, genes, uh, of whom the Bush daughters are an example, um, they have very different body types, they can have very different body weights and obesity status, and uh, are a good example of even though they've been raised in the exact same family environment, same as the monozygotic twins. Well, we've talked a little bit about this environment, and so let's talk a little bit about the hot air. So you saw some maps earlier, and these are from the CDC Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Study, which does a yearly state-by-state -state evaluation of heights and weights of Americans and calculates their BMI. So here in 1990, let's see if I can get an arrow here. In 1990, you see that we were kind of a light blue nation. Um, we had obesity rates uh, all under 15%, uh, which is close to the uh, historic average of obesity rates of 8%. Within nine years, at 1999, we've become a dark blue and tan country, which means that obesity rates have risen to over 15% in almost all the states, and in many states, we're 20 to 25%. By 2008, a mere nine years later, we have the majority of states with obesity rates over 25%, and many with obesity rates over 30%. The average uh, obesity, on, in general, obesity rates run about 32% in the United States. There's variability uh, by racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and geographic uh, status. So clearly, uh, there was an increase in epidemic proportions that happened very quickly, and our genes definitely didn't change that fast. So how do we reconcile the fact that so much of our body weight is determined by our genes, and yet clearly these environmental changes have impacted obesity rates? Well, there was a classic study done in the 1990s by Claude Bouchard and colleagues, and it was a twin study. And what it demonstrated was that genes actually influence not just your ultimate body weight, but the degree of weight change when the environment changes. So I'm gonna run through this graph a little bit for you. On the y-axis, um, you have uh, data from one twin of a monozygotic twin pair. And on the uh, x-axis, you have the data from the second twin. Now, all of these twins were male pairs who were housed together and for 100 days and overfed 1,000 calories a day. <laughs> and then they monitored how much their weight changes. Each dot on the graph is a pair of, represents a pair of twins, and the closer that dot is to this central line, the more similar their weight changed during this overfeeding study. So what you see is that while there's a lot of variability in how much weight people gained, pairs tended to be much more similar to each other than they were to their unrelated uh, also participants. So if your twin gained uh, 10 to 12 kilograms, you were very likely to also gain uh, over 10 kilograms. Or if you gained more like six kilograms, then your twin gained a similar amount. So these findings, again, uh, help us understand and reconcile the fact that our genes have not changed very much during this obesity epidemic. But what's happened is the air going into all of our balloons increased in certain ways, such as increased portion size, poor sleep, chronic stress, increased sedentary behavior, reduced work activity behavior, and multiple other factors. And uh, the people who were at risk started developing this disease. So that is how genes and environment can both matter. Let's talk about this body weight regulatory system because people didn't gain weight forever in this study. And in fact, some people stopped at about six kilograms despite the fact that they continued to eat over 1,000 calories more than what they needed every day. So clearly our body is able to put a lid on it and stop it. So what is that that's doing that? This is the system of energy homeostasis. And really, honestly, this has been described over the last, say, 15 uh, to 20 years at the most. 
Before that, people kind of thought about body fat as uh, you know, this lumpy area where the body just shoves some uh, fat, and if we needed it for energy later, we would take it out. But what we now understand is it's an amazingly complicated endocrine organ. And it releases many different hormones, of which one of the most important and famous is leptin. So our body fat stores are constantly sending signals to our brain uh, that help influence our appetite and our metabolism. Let's see, so if we're starting here down at the fat stores, they release these signals which are in general termed adiposity signals derived from the fat, such as leptin, and those circulate in the blood and go up to important areas of the brain, such as the hypothalamus. And there they can signal um, to two different pathways that are divided between um, neurons in the brain that drive energy uh, loss or expenditure and neurons that drive um, energy conservation. So if our leptin levels rise, we will stimulate those neurons in the catabolic pathway that will help us to burn or allow us to burn energy. Our appetite will be suppressed and our metabolic rate will rise. At the same time, these signals from the fat suppress the pathways that would normally be stimulating our food appetite and slowing our energy expenditure. And through these coordinated actions, they bring uh, us back into energy balance. So leptin uh, was discovered, um, and it was kind of called the fat hormone and, or the fat gene. So the OB, uh, this is an OB-OB mouse, uh, and you can guess, guess which one it is that doesn't have the leptin. So uh, the mouse that doesn't have the leptin uh, is very round um, and uh, doesn't have normal mouse appearance. And when leptin was discovered, they thought, oh my gosh, look how you know, fat this mouse has become. This must be the problem with obesity. We can just give people leptin. We're going to cure obesity. And unfortunately, that was not the case because although leptin regulates body fat stores and can suppress appetite and raise metabolic rate, leptin levels are actually high in obesity. So this was a study done here um, by Scott Weigel in uh, the Division of Endocrinology, and what you can see in this graph is a bunch of individuals mapped out by their percentage of body fat, and then their leptin level is what's on the y-axis. So as people gain body fat, you see leptin levels rising exponentially, actually, um, up to very high rates in the most obese individuals. So what this uh, means is that in obesity, it is a disease in which leptin <coughs> is no longer effective at regulating appetite and metabolism. This is very similar to what um, Dr. Hirsch was just talking about in terms of the fact that in type 2 diabetes, insulin becomes less and less effective. That's that concept of insulin resistance. And this is sometimes called leptin resistance, although there's a little bit of controversy about it and we don't know why it occurs. So remember one other thing about the uh, disease state of obesity, which is that uh, as leptin <coughs> levels rise, these levels that could keep people weight stable uh, when their body fat was appropriate are no longer able to keep the body weight in a healthy range. How does leptin and these other uh, responses contribute to that wrinkliness that happens when you end up shrinking the balloon? So here is a study by uh, my, uh, Mike Rosenbaum and Rudy Leibel out at Columbia. And they uh, took a sample of people, some of whom were obese and had high leptin levels, and some of whom were lean and had low leptin, leptin levels, and subjected them all to a 10% weight loss. And what happened in all of them is that their leptin levels fell. Well, that makes a little bit of sense, right? They lost some fat, uh, their fat, they don't have as much, their leptin won't be released from the fat in quite a, uh, quite as high amount. But if you look to this other graph, what you see is that even though they lost 10% of weight, their leptin levels dropped by 30% or more. So when weight loss occurs, the body overreacts. Uh, the body responds out of proportion to the weight loss in order to defend our energy stores that we need for survival. So weight loss uh, lowers leptin levels and also lowers metabolism. Remember that leptin should be stimulating metabolism and suppressing appetite. And that is one of the common things that happen. In this particular study, they actually gave leptin replacement to the individuals, and the people who received leptin injections gained back less weight than the ones that didn't. 
Uh, so they're uh, continuing to explore uh, those kinds of treatment opportunities for leptin. Let's talk about one of the other home hormones that regulates body weight, ghrelin. So ghrelin is a peptide hormone that's released in the stomach. It's really interesting. It's one of the only circulating hormones that actually stimulates appetite and slows metabolism. And it follows this fascinating pattern where it rises before a meal and then falls once the nutrients come into contact with the gut. And this is patterns from two diff different individuals through breakfast, lunch, dinner, and nighttime. So what happens after weight loss with ghrelin? Well, this is also another study done here by David Cummings. Um, these are the ghrelin levels of individuals who are obese uh, before they undergo weight loss. And these are the levels after weight loss. So you see that weight loss causes an increase in ghrelin level, which will tend to stimulate appetite. So the thing that I want to impress upon you is our body does not distinguish between being obese or lean when we lose weight. It simply responds by saying, I'm hungry. You need to increase our energy stores. I've lost too many energy stores. And that is sometimes called the set point, um, so that when people are reduced from their set point, the body stimulates hunger. I was curious about how these uh, facts, um, how hunger and being weight reduced, might interact with our environment um, in a way that would uh, support or make weight loss more difficult. So what we did is we looked at something called functional magnetic resonance imaging to understand what was happening in the brain when people are hungry that altered the way food looked to us, whether it looked good or not. And what we found was that as hunger increases, key brain areas become more responsive to fattening or high calorie type foods. So real briefly, functional magnetic resonance imaging is a way of indirectly measuring neural activity. We look at how the brain is responding to photographs, in this case, of foods that were ranked as foods you shouldn't try and eat if you're dieting. We call them fattening foods and compare that to the way the brain responds when people are looking at images of non-fattening foods, which were rated as foods you could be acceptable to eat when you're dieting. And when you compare those two, um, you can see uh, the difference in activation or neural activity between them. What we found is that as people become more hungry, particular areas of the brain are more stimulated relatively by these high calorie foods than they are by, it's cake over carrots, so more cake than carrots. And the hungrier people rated themselves, the greater that effect was. Now the amygdala is a part of the brain which establishes our uh, associations between cues in our environment, uh, like a photograph or an image, and their reward value. Uh, the medial orbital frontal cortex is actually a secondary taste regulation region and also helps us decide what to do uh, about a uh, particular uh, need that our body has to be fulfilled. So you see that these brain areas are uh, stimulated um, uh, and they're suppressed after eating. Uh, so part of the process of normal eating is uh, suppressing activation by these high calorie foods. And there are several studies that indicate that when obesity is present, that process is impaired. So can we, can we make a difference uh, when this disease is present? And the answer is yes. There is actually a lot of good news in that regard. Um, and the thing that it's most easy to make a difference with is uh, the health effects and health consequences of obesity. So um, currently, treatment uh, recommendations are uh, in agreement that weight loss through intensive behavioral treatment is recommended. Intensive behavioral treatment um, is, as it sounds, intensive. It's a series of frequent visits with a provider. And it's recommended for anyone who has a BMI over 30 or a person who has a weight in the overweight range but also has a risk factor for cardiovascular disease or has cardiovascular disease itself. So that includes high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes or prediabetes, as Dr. Hirsch discussed, or obstructive sleep apnea. And what intensive behavioral treatment involves is some basic changes that are meant to be permanent lifestyle changes that reduce calories a little bit, that increase activity a little bit, and change behaviors to add things such as self-monitoring, um, and uh, the ability to really uh, proactively manage your weight over time. 
Intensive behavioral treatment does not result in dramatic weight loss. It results in weight losses between 5 and 10% of body weight. But the good news is those can have big effects on health. They improve blood pressure, they improve HDL cholesterol, they decrease a person's chance of developing diabetes, and that uh, is proven to uh, persist until 15 years after participation in one of these programs. It improves blood sugar control for people who have diabetes, can reduce the need for medications, improves fertility in obese women, can improve pain and functioning. So 5 to 10% body weight loss, uh, here's an example of its effects on the fasting glucose. Um, you see that even a weight loss of 2 to 5% does reduce fasting glucose here. But weight losses of 5 to 10% have a pretty decent effect. And for people who are able to go a little bit more, you can get some dramatic differences. So what are the implications of our collective in this room understanding of obesity at this time? So I hope that you all will give a, a firm yes if I put up my question of is obesity a disease or not? Um, and you're, you're with me on that at this point. Um, what are the implications of what we talked about? Well, because both genes and environment matter, we can't really change our genes. So that leaves us with changing our environment. And what I would say is that we need to think about ways to reduce the air going into all of our balloons. So that will help the balloons that are still small not pass that point where the system breaks down and the disease develops. It'll help the uh, balloons that have already blown big to not expand to the point where they get leaks uh, and develop the kinds of uh, diabetes or other complications uh, that are the real hazard of obesity. Um, and it also serves to help us focus um, our, on prevention on catching people early. So the fact that body weight is regulated means that we want to uh, capture this issue while that system is retaining its resistance. So while it's still kind of hard to blow up the balloon. So focusing on children, uh, focusing on uh, keeping individuals who have not become obese from gaining weight uh, while that system is still functioning. We learn that the body resists weight loss. Uh, and the implication of that is treatment for obesity really uh, requires permanent lifestyle changes. So intensive behavioral treatment or other types of programs where people make small but uh, lingering changes uh, are the way to go uh, and can improve health. Uh, these treatments uh, implications are that small amounts of weight loss matter for your health and there is actually a lot we can do uh, to improve this illness. Right now, we cannot cure obesity. And Dr. Kandewal, uh, after the break, will talk about um, the best treatment that we have for this disease uh, at this point, which is bariatric surgery. But we can't cure it yet. And what I'd like to point out is the importance of continuing our research, because there are large gaps in our understanding of this disease. We actually don't know what it is that makes the balloons wrinkly after people lose weight. If you could figure out what has changed in that system uh, and restore the body weight functional system, you could cure obesity. So I would like you all to take those lessons uh, home. Hopefully they're ones that you can act on in your own life or with people around you. I appreciate all of your attention and I'd like to acknowledge all the folks that helped me with my research and contributed uh, to this study. Uh, and I appreciate uh, your being here today. Thanks so much.